magnitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. That is a very powerful, revelatory, insightful statement that will help you tremendously in the study of theology. Because when it says, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, Adam underscore Adam's, who refers back to Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. So what the Bible is saying here, that Adam was the figure of him that was to come. Who was it that was to come? Jesus. So what the Bible is saying here, that when God bent low over the dust and the clay of the earth and shaped Adam, he shaped him into the image that he himself wanted to become. It's like an artist sitting across a room looking at a model and sculpting because what he's seeing, or an artist sitting here and a model here and painting what he is seeing. God did exactly the same thing. God, the creator himself, took the dust of the earth, clay, shaped it into an image, a likeness, that he himself wanted to become. It was just inanimated until the Creator bent lower and breathed into that clay image the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is not particularly in this lesson, but it's interesting and noteworthy. If you understand what I just said, God bent over mud, earth, clay. That's one part. And he breathed into that clay image the breath of life, that spirit. And man became a living soul, that spirit. Man is two-thirds spirit. He's only one-third clay. That's why human beings, no matter who they are, what their background is, what their religion is, when they come into the presence of the one true God, the spiritual part of them recognizes the Creator. They can feel the reality of the one true God. And conviction begins to grip them. And they'll be either begin to weep, they'll begin to resist it, or they'll grip the back of a pew, or their hands will become wet, their heart will begin to pound, because the spiritual side of them recognizes the one true God who is a spirit. It's powerful. So here, God made Adam into that which he himself wanted to become when the hour arrived for him to come into the world, Emmanuel. So, near this verse, write Genesis 18.25, and then turn to Genesis 18.25. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, God was a spirit. A spirit does not have a form that you can see. So what God did in the Old Testament, he took on a temporary form or image so that man could see him. These temporary forms were called theophanies. They were only temporary manifestations of God. Temporary. Everyone say temporary. So here... <clears throat> In Genesis 18.25, when God was going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the Lord appeared to Abraham on the plains of Mamre. And in verse 2 of chapter 18, and three men stood by him. One of those angels, one of those presentations or manifestations was God himself. And here's how to show it. Here's how to prove it. Two of them were angels, but one of them was God himself. Because if you look 
At verse 22, if you look at verse 17, Abraham bargained with God to save the city. Now you'll remember, in the beginning, when God shows Abraham, God instituted a blood covenant relationship with Abraham. In other words, God being a spirit had no blood, but he said, you take a heifer for me, and I'll give you the right and the covenant of circumcision, which would be blood involved. In other words, God said to Abraham, you and I will mingle our blood together. We will enter into a blood covenant relationship. So Abraham became then, through an, a blood covenant relationship, an earth partner with the Creator himself. So now God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he warns Abraham. But if you look here, God made a promise that there would be a son born to them. And Abraham keeps, keeps dealing with him. How can Abraham keep bargaining with him if you find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? And he couldn't find 50, 40, 30, 20. It got all the way down. How can Abraham do something like that with God? Because he was an earth partner with God. And God will not break that, shall we say, legal bondage, that legal binding. So Abraham could bargain with God and persuade him to, to do what Abraham wanted to save those that could be saved. Verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? <clears throat> Look at verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Underscore the Lord there. One of those angels was God manifested in a theophany form, a temporal manifestation. Go down to 25. This is the clincher. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. Again, Abraham is bargaining with God and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. See, Abraham is using words. And then he says to God, one of these angels that he sees, manifestations, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The judge of all the earth is God himself. He addressed him as God. It was a theophany. And the Lord Capitulated. This is what is interesting here about this. <clears throat> no matter how wicked Singapore would become, no matter how vile Singapore might become, God forbid, but as long as Pastor Timothy is here, Bishop Willoughby is here pleading for the souls of this nation, God will never destroy it. That's the kind of power we have. That's why it's so powerful to have a man of God as a pastor, because he is a negotiator between this whole nation and the Creator himself. Lift your hands and worship God for that. Utha karisha tarvika shamaya, handola varisha taya. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you. For God among us, I thank you for men of God with us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. God with us, men of God among us, and vice versa. Glory be to God. What a majestic plan. What a glorious stature that we find ourselves in. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Everyone say amen. 
Now from here, here's another theophany. Go to Genesis 32 and 24. Genesis, under that verse, I'm sorry, in Genesis 18:25, write uh, Genesis 32:24, and then go to Genesis chapter 32. Here again, God appears as in a theophany form, a temporary manifestation. In this setting, we have Jacob wrestling with an angel. <clears throat> that is no ordinary angel. If you look at verse 24 in chapter 32, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Underscore the word Jacob there, and underscore uh, wrestled, and underscore until the breaking of the day. Jacob was wrestling with this angel. And the wrestling continued, and uh, the admonition was for Jacob to let go. And Jacob said, I will not let go. I will not let you go. I will not let you go. And Jacob, in verse 29, asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob would not let go. And Jacob, in verse 30, here it is. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For, underscore this. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. That was a miracle to Jacob. Here he wrestled with God himself in theophany form. Under that verse, write Daniel 3.25 and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3 and verse 25. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. The three Hebrew children in this setting were thrown into the fiery furnace because they would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar. At this point, the Hebrew children were in bondage in Babylon. <coughs> and we'll discuss that more in Daniel's 70th week. But here, when the three Hebrew children said to Nebuchadnezzar, Be it known unto thee, whether our God delivereth us or, delivereth us or not, we will not bow down to thee nor thy image. So Nebuchadnezzar commanded that they heat the furnace seven times hotter, as I recall here, and threw in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. <clears throat> Verse 25, he answered and said, 